Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and welcome to the program or good afternoon. My name is Adam Yormack and I'm a, a lay leader and I'm on the uh, regional board in Miami. I'm also the chair of Lawyers for Israel and I'm a co-chair of the Real Estate Committee with Mitch Feldman. I run Yormack Law, a uh, firm for business and real estate and also Alligator Title and Escrow. So uh, we're all very familiar now with Zoom. And so I'm gonna address a couple of the house rules and the format for the rest of this presentation, which should be fantastic. Um, all of the members in the audience for the moment are now on mute um, and we'll be sharing slides and pre-recorded videos throughout the presentation. Um, you'll be able to post questions into the chat um, as you like, and we'll address those at the end of the program. Um, once we open the Q&A uh, and it concludes, or once we finish and the Q&A opens, um, we're going to do a members only a breakout room with our featured speaker. Uh, so we're all looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to uh, for, just talk about JNF for a moment. And for those of you who are not familiar, we are a non denominational apolitical 501c3 not for profit fundraising organization to continue the development of the state of Israel. Um, we're founded in 1901 through community global fundraising. The organization acquired land from the Ottoman Empire that would become the land of Israel officially in uh, or recognized, I should say, in 1948. Today, we continue the work of building new communities in the southern Negev and the northern Galilee regions. Our partners and volunteers include people from all backgrounds and faiths. Okay, before we get started on today's program and our video, um, I want to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for uh, their support of um, everything we're doing in the state of Israel through JNF and for this program specifically, the Glickman Family Foundation, Mara Mauds and Lenny Wolf of Cornerstone Group, Mitch Feldman of the Feldman Companies, David Rosenthal of Curtis Rosenthal Inc., Adam Belfer of HIG Realty Partners, Steve Brom of George Smith Partners, Karen Kennedy of National Asset Services, William Bernfeld of Ackerman, John Speck, uh, excuse me, John Spelke, uh, excuse, sorry if I mispronunciated that, John Spelke of Encore Real Estate Advisors, Stuart Myers of the Myers Group, Scott Brenner of CBRE, uh, myself for Alligator Title and Escrow, Scott Krieger individually, and our friends of, uh, at Royal Restoration and our friends at Blade Title Company. Uh, quickly on Blade, Blade Title Company is attorney owned, established more than 50 years ago. It operates in South Florida, providing title insurance for both uh, commercial and real estate transactions, as well as refis. Blade Title is proud to be a sponsor of the JNF Real Estate Division. Uh, there are many ways to support JNF, and Blade Title has chosen to donate a significant amount of every net title premium referred to it by members of the JNF Real Estate Division for closings financings or refinancings. Ahare, the call of the IDF, follow us. Blade Title encourages current and new members joining today to make their commitment to JNF. Cole Hakavod, uh, leading by example to Blade Title for inspiring this commitment. So thank you so much to Blade Title. Uh, a quick follow-up to my fellow event chairs, um, Mitch Feldman, Adam Belfour, Scott Gendel, David Rosenthal, and Jonathan Stern. Uh, thank you all for all your hard work getting this put together. Um, and without further ado, let's take a high level look at the work we're doing in a quick 60 second video clip. It all begins with a vision, a vision of lush and breathtaking forests where once was only rocky and brown land, a vision of transforming the Negev and the Galilee injecting a vitality that is transforming them into places people want to live. A vision for us to speak our values, leaving no one behind. A vision of quenching the thirst of Israel's population and allowing the agricultural economy to thrive. A vision that searches for solutions that will make a better tomorrow. A vision of a continuum, ensuring that we are raising tomorrow's leaders today. A vision that understands that a nation must know its past to create a stronger future. Be a part of our vision. Join us. Excellent. 
Uh, my fellow co-chair and founding member of JNF's Real Estate of South Florida, uh, my good friend Mitch Feldman. He's president of the Feldman Companies in North Miami. Uh, he's one of the first developers to build multi-story uh, multi self-storage facilities in commercial locations and one of the first to develop them outside of the United States. They own and directly manage projects from beginning to end with land selection, contract negotiation, legal and permitting through construction management, lease up, financing and sales. Mitch, take it away. Well, it's a, it's a absolutely a pleasure to be here today with this uh I mean, just looking at the names that were on that sponsorship list and going through the Zoom, seeing who's on here. I mean, we're joined today by really great uh, real estate pros, architects, developers, engineers, attorneys, and a bunch of people just related to the industry as professionals. And um, it's great to see so many people from, from around the US for our second uh, national JNF real estate event. And it's great to see it growing. Uh, this new philanthropic society is made up of hundreds of professionals in our field, um, and they're all joining as members to support the work of JNF in Israel, to network and to make deals with each other. And we all know there's no better mitzvah than to, for all of us to support each other and our people in our homeland. So we hope everyone will uh, decide to join, become a member and participate and get involved. Uh, JNF has long been in the business of building communities and uh, being a stakeholder in Israel. Um, we were the original real estate developers of Israel. And uh, many may not know, but JNF's historic land purchases in the beginning of the 20th century were thanks to Yeshua um, Hankin, who was a real estate agent. So there's a vision now, and you just saw in the video about bringing 300,000 people to live in the Galilee. 500,000 people in the Negev and JNF is improving the quality of life in these areas. They're doing regional development, building neighborhoods, special needs facilities, medical centers, and so much more. So together, all of us were transforming the landscape of Israel and paving the way for future generations. We'd love for everyone to stay involved and get involved. Yeah, exactly. So Mitch, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for, uh, for laying that out. So in 2018, uh, we started this, this group, this idea to bring all the real estate professionals in the community together. That was started in 2008 in New York. And, uh, and now in 2020, we've opened it up in South Florida, Chicago, Atlanta, and Los Angeles are regions that are leading the way. And uh, it's a prime opportunity for us to leverage uh, our relationships and, 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 and the friends and family that we have that we can pull into this, this group and these chapters. So with this in mind, um, I'm asking you to consider joining the JNF uh, family today the, in, into the real estate division. Um, it's a tax deductible donation. It's $1,800. Um, and you can make that donation through uh, monthly multiple payments, a lump sum throughout the campaign year. Um, a couple of the great features of joining us is that your gift, your gift will include a complimentary sponsorship for future events. Um, these are national events that get to be uh, advertised, uh, not only through our program leaders and, and anybody wants to participate, but the uh, 60,000 person email list that exists within the group as well. So it gives everybody a lot of exposure. Um, members also receive exclusive access to a um, this, was a, this has been an idea that's been long in, the, in coming, but it's been uh, very, very well planned and executed on, which is a list of all of the um, referral, people who opt into this referral directory for us to share leads and uh, contacts. So that's a great perk. Um, this is a great investment with a nice ROI. Um, and we think of it as a, a way to also express not only our hearts and where we're at mentally, but also to grow friendships in our business as well. So uh, thank you for all that everybody does on this, uh, on this call and for your tzedakah. And um, without further ado, let's, let me just introduce our speaker here. Today's program is part of the Jewish Disabilities Awareness and Inclus Inclusion Month. Um, so if you decided to join, all donations this month are uh, designated to our Disabilities Action Area, which is being matched up to a million dollars nationally. So you can double your impact by raising today. So every dollar you donate today gets, uh, gets matched. Um, the great program ahead is we're going to hear from a few minutes from Avnet Kleiner, who's the Director of Development for ADI Negev, formerly the uh, Ale Negev. Avnet uh, has experience in the nonprofit world, having funded two nonprofits, Alpha, in advance, to advance the rights of Israeli Holocaust survivals and what's 
What's Israel? A Hashbara, which means public diplomacy organization that recruits, trains, and sends students to university campuses worldwide to promote constructive conversations about Israel. Um, he's now contributing his skills and experience to the, de the development of the ADI Negev Nahalet Eran, formerly Aleph Neget Ahalet Eran. So uh, difficult uh, describing it, but he's going to come <laughs> talk about all of it here in a second. So he's pioneering the rehabilitation of villages in the Israelis Negev um, who, and provides severely disabled children and adults a comprehensive framework in which to live their life um, the best they can. Avnet works closely with the chairman of ADI Negev, IDF Major General uh, of the Reserves, or now is retired, Doran Olamog, and spreads Olamog's message of opportunity uh, to the village, presenting them with uh, Tikam Olam and creating a better society for the disabled folks and themselves. Uh, Avnet and his wife, Adva, uh, are also living between the United States and Israel during the year. So with that, Avnet, thanks so much for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be with the um, uh, real estate division here today. It's so good to see familiar faces such as Jeff Levine, who is a huge supporter for us and for Jewish National Fund of the Jewish People. Alice, of course, uh, a Hebrew speaker, so it's always fun to be near you. I see Scott, which is the farthest, coolest donor I ever had. Eric Foreman, that his wife, uh, Rhonda, uh, volunteered with us uh, over three months already, and many, many other faces. Sorry if I miss anyone. Also a lot of new faces, so it's great to be with you. Uh, as Adam uh, say my name, my name is Avnet Kleiner. I'm an Israeli. I'm representing Adi Negev Nachalateran in the United States. So I want to speak briefly today about Adi Negev and about the real estate component of Adi Negev. Um, so we are opening the Jewish Disability Awareness Month. Uh, and as I said, it's great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, Adi Negev is a rehabilitation uh, village, unique. There is nothing like this in the world. We have 170 severe special need people. Severe people that cannot live in the community, people that in the past were abandoned. We are sitting on, sorry, the north part of the Negev in Israel near Be'er Sheva. We have hydrotherapy, food, we have animals therapy, beautiful, beautiful place. But the question that I want to uh, point out today, what's the connection of Jewish National Fund, which is amazing organization that build communities, planting trees, creating a water industry in Israel. What's to them and special need people? Why they would support special need village, right? That's the question that we have to point out. But Adi Negev, it's much, much more than what I described. Adi Negev today, uh, creating 40,000 rehabilitation treatments for people in the Negev, for ordinary people, not just special needs. Because we are located in the Negev and we have really super professional uh, facility, why not to open it for everybody? So in this way, as I said, 40,000 people a year great, get treatments inside a D Negev. So for example, a soldier that was injured in Gaza, we are not far from Gaza, and his family lives in Be'er Sheva, in the past had to go to Tel Aviv to get proper treatment rehabilitation treatment. Now he has it around the corner, five minutes from his home. So that's great. The second thing that we are doing is a special education school. We are providing 120 uh, students with mild special needs, people that don't live there. So we create services for families that had special need child. If we, we are not there, they will move to Tel Aviv. Uh, we, have, we are going to build now the first and only rehabilitation hospital in the Negev. Currently in Israel, you have three hospitals for rehabilitation, the three of them in the center of Israel. So Adi Negev is going to be the first and only. We're going to have 108 beds. And in this way, more than 100,000 people a year will be able to get rehabilitation services, double the number that we are having now. Uh, inside this hospital, we are going to build a research center with the conjunction with Johns Hopkins, from Baltimore, 
שירלי ריין אביליטי לאב אין שיקגו, וייזמן אינסטיטוט, בן גוריון אוניברסיטי, עיר ביד אוניברסיטי אוף ג'ורדן, all of them together going to do a research on brain damages and all kind of neurological uh, defects inside a Dinegel Nachalat Iran. Meaning we are creating, now we have 1,000 uh, job opportunities, in the future we are going to create 2,000. We are going to have retail center for you know, people that will come to the hospital, hotel. We are going to have a development building for professional staff. And the 10-year plan for now, we are going to build a new community for 600 families, people that will work there or, or families members that their loved one are in Adin Negev Nachalat Iran. So a new community for 600 families. So what I'm trying to say in, uh, in different words is that we are creating so many real, uh, real estate uh, values for the Negev of Israel. And this is why Jewish National Fund investing so much in us. Adi in Hebrew means jewel. So we are going to be or already be the jewel of the Negev and the jewel of Blueprint Negev of Jewish National Fund. And we are going to play a huge role in the real estate of the Negev. And now I want to uh, uh, share with you an announcement from Adi Negev from the founder of, of the place, Major General Doron Almog. Can you play it, please? To our friend in JNF United States and the national real estate developers, thank you for your commitment to disabled people. I'm a father to Iran Almog, who was born with severe brain injury. Never spoke one word, never made eye contact, and he was the greatest professor of my life. Iran passed away 14 years ago. For him, we built this village, special community center, social community center, integrating disabled with ordinary people. Right now, we are building a new rehabilitation hospital for all the negative population. We have built a community for 500 families. Thank you for your dedication, for your commitment. Thank you for supporting us. I take this opportunity to invite you, come and visit and be our partners for more commitments, for make, for make a better world. Tikkun Olam. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your time and if you want to have uh, any question later uh, Mike can uh, share my email uh, enjoy the, the the event today thank you thank you Abnet a D negative a D negative is a jewel and truly an inspiring place our firm Cornerstone group is proud to be a sponsor today and a member of the JNF Real Estate Society. My partner, Mara Mades, and the Cornerstone Group support one of JNF's other special needs programs, the Red Mountain Therapeutic Horseback Riding Center at Kibbutz Grofit. I'm pleased to introduce today today's featured speaker, Russell Galvin, Managing Principal of Crescent Heights, one of America's largest and most respected residential developers of quality apartments and condominiums. Crescent Heights has been active in over 15 markets throughout the United States and has developed over 50,000 multifamily units and pioneered the concept of hotel condominiums. Mr. Galbit is also chairman of the board of Norwegian Cruise Lines, a Fortune 500 company, and is, um, sorry, is on the Dean's Advisory Board of Cornell University School of Hotel Administration and the prestigious Simon Wiesenthal Organization. And now enjoy today's fireside chat with Mitch Feldman and Russell Galbit, and there'll be a live Q&A after the video. Thanks. So hi, Russell. It's great to be here with you today, and thank you for joining us on this uh, fireside chat. So we appreciate your time. 
And, you know, so many businesses, small businesses, the public, they've been really forever affected and hurt. And, you know, so you're, you're very in tune with what's happening from your perspective and in your business, what are you seeing? What effect has all this disruption had on the real estate industry and where is our real estate market going today? You know, there's no question we're living in unprecedented times. Uh, what happened from the plague and, uh, uh, and this terrible virus, you know, no one has seen before and no one could have planned it. Uh, nobody could have predicted it. it it's something that uh, is really awful and, um, and has really changed the world. And I think it's fundamentally changed a lot of the world and the way we do business, the way we interact, um, and the way we relate to our fellow uh, community members. And I think that uh, there's a general uh, yearning by everybody to really want to get back into the, uh, uh, into the world of meeting people and, and actually uh, talking to people. So look, it's like uh, that movie, Back to the Future. You know, when you get in the car, whatever you do, don't press 2020, <laughs> whatever you do. So, I mean, uh, it's been um, really one heck of a year. Um, but that doesn't mean we won't come out of it. And, um, and it has been a tough year. I mean, a lot of families have lost important people. Um, but you know what? That happens every year. It's just this year we had a terrible virus uh, that uh, was unprecedented uh, in our times. Um, so as it relates to real estate, um, real estate has suffered. Uh, and depending on market segmentation, different markets have suffered more. Um, and different locations have suffered more. Uh, locations with good governance uh, has had the least effect. Uh, locations with poor governance uh, has had worse effects. So, you know, it all depends on, on how we relate to each other and in this community. But I do believe real estate has fundamentally changed, um, especially when looking at the different asset classes. Uh, I think industrial uh, and home delivery has increased uh, significantly and the value of industrial is gonna continue to increase. Um, when you hear of uh, home delivery services adding 350,000 jobs in a single quarter, um, you know, that uh, grocery deliveries is, a, is yeah. a business of the future. There's no doubt about it. Uh, when it comes to retail, I think that's changed considerably uh, in the sense that, um, you know, people are buying more and more online. And the retail uh, sh stores that uh, developed an online service are the ones that have done exceedingly well. Those who are stuck in the past have not. And so you'll see a lot of change in this area. And, um, and I think that uh, change sometimes is positive. Uh, I think also that uh, having the opportunity to shop on the internet also gives you the opportunity to buy the same relative, relatively the same goods, but uh, perhaps at a better price uh, proposition because you can go to many different uh, computer programs that allow you to shop for price. So well, I so think- let, let me ask you something that you just mentioned with really it's technology played a factor. I mean, in 2009, you know, we also had a crisis. It was a little different, right? I mean, it was a financial crisis and we saw that there was a, a change in the market there too. Why do you think it's, is it different this time? Is it affecting different segments? And do you think that is because of the technology or some of the things that you just mentioned? I, I think that uh, uh, it, I think there's a major change because what happened then was a complete breakdown of the economy. Um, and it was, a, it was really a recession. What happened here was uh, an existential force that came in uh, and delivered a virus that no one could have predicted, no one could have guessed, and, um, and forced a, a quick lifestyle change. And the fact is, is that uh, it was a godsend that we had teams that was delivered literally six months before this. Uh, Zoom became very popular. And then overnight, there was a hundred other services that you could actually um, communicate with your fellow business person in, in a different format. And everybody adopted. I think that's one of the greatest strengths that we have as being part of the human race is that we can adopt to, to new theories and new things. Um, we're still young enough to, to learn. Uh, the truth is, is that, you know, I wasn't born of the computer age. Uh, these young kids today, they, they, they have it, you know, they have such an advantage because it's all about integration. It's all about uh, um, 
being able to adapt to the new systems of today. And that's why I say the day of going into the retail stores uh, for shopping for all of your goods is gone forever. Uh, your right. basic goods can be bought over online. They can be compared, comparatively shopped. Um, and, uh, and I know that Amazon has a lead today, but there'll be other Amazons and they'll have to be able to be smarter, to reinvent themselves, to be able to deliver faster, uh, to, to give a compelling argument of why they are better. Not just the fact that they're the alternative to Amazon, um, mm -hmm. because people will demand service. They'll demand delivery. They'll, they'll demand pricing. So whoever is going to give Amazon a shot is going to need to provide a comparative service because people, uh, demand excellence and uh, typically. And excellence is defined by the right price, the right product delivered on the right time. So I think all of these things are, are important. Retail is still gonna be important and it's still gonna play a major role in real estate because people want to go out. They've been stuck in their homes for, for months and months. And you see some of these uh, events that go on Thousands of people show up and, and you say, how is it possible that thousands of people show up? Because you know what? They're stuck in their home. Um, they have a, a beautiful or a fantastic spouse. But no matter how fantastic the spouse is, they want to relate to uh, other than just their children and their, their spouse. So I, I think that uh, retail centers that have activities, restaurants and, and, and uh, even game activities, things like that, uh, people will go back to once this vaccine is widely spread. And I don't have to tell you, we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, delivery dates are being scheduled in December for the vaccine. People are lining up to take the vaccine. And yes, we do have some silly arguments as who gets it first and who doesn't get it first. But I think the government has it well in control. And I think that um, we're very fortunate that, uh, that they put the emphasis on this because no one wants to see um, death that can be avoided. And this can be avoided uh, if we get the vaccine widely spread out there. Uh, another area that of real estate that's been affected is really the office space, right. because um, yeah, you know all, it's going to be hard for people to return to offices full time because it's been terrific being at home, and we've also become much more efficient uh, because we've become a twenty four hour business community. Okay, right. you don't have to respond by five o'clock. You can wake up at two o'clock in the morning and send your response and forget about that matter. It's really that simple where we have the ability to be a 24 hour community. Still, office space will be in demand because people still need to socialize. They still need to uh, be able to have a think room. Um, you know, we call it sometimes a Zoom room uh, and you can even have it in your own house. And many people do have it in their own house. But if, if you're running a major business, you're gonna want to feel it and be part of it. So I don't think offices are out uh, completely. And then and as it relates to- I was gonna ask you, so some of those spaces, I mean, I guess what we're seeing is maybe a repurpose of some of these spaces. I mean, like what you're saying is that maybe some more activities and I think, I think you're hundred percent right. People wanna get out. And so maybe there'll be an adaptive reuse of some of these retail properties, um, maybe the office. Have you seen any of that at this point? I know that we converted some stuff to storage. I know that people are looking for um, distribution centers, maybe in these Walmarts, the big empty boxes. Have you seen any of those adaptive reuses taking place at this point? They're, they're, they're already starting to take place, okay? I mean, we do get calls from all over America. You know, we have this shopping center. We can get it rezoned. You can build 2,000 apartments. And, and you yeah. even see it locally here, you know, with uh, uh, some of the individuals buying existing shopping centers and adding on 1,400 apartments to them because it doesn't work without that. Without yeah. that, it doesn't work. And, um, and one feeds off the other, and it's logical. So I, I think that you're gonna find efficiency increase. And I, and I sort of like that because what it means is, is that uh, uh, we don't take more forests and uh, landscaping areas, make parking lots out of them. And, uh, um, and we, we repurpose what we have existing that needs to be repurposed. So I think you're in a very good field, uh, Mitchell, because you do do storage. And I think storage is something that's very much in demand. Um, and, and I will tell you that uh, as it relates to, to offices, um, you also have a, an opportunity here. And uh, what is the opportunity is that I think that, uh, you know, we, we've all been through COVID and experienced it. We've all learned a lot. And, uh, you know, when we first started with COVID 20, 
5 to 27% of everybody who went into the hospital, we lost. Right. Today, very few go into the hospital and even fewer do we lose. I mean, right. I think it's one out of 10 we might have a problem with that has some sort of serious issue. But those are only the ones admitted to the hospital. And you know that we're not admitting anybody to the hospital today unless they critically need it. So, uh, but we've learned these protocols. And one of the protocols is obviously, uh, or some of the protocols is obviously the air conditioning systems. Uh, we know that we need fresh air in our office buildings. Um, and we know that we need to have uh, uh, filtration systems throughout the office building, uh, uh, handless entryways, things of that nature. So what in, what in actuality happens here is that there's a huge, huge, huge opportunity to new office builders. Mm -hmm. And the reason it is, is because uh, you cannot uh, bring a building that was built 20 years ago as an office building uh, to meet today all of the COVID protocols. It's some, not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were able to do it, it would be millions of dollars. You'd have to change the fenestration system. You'd have to change your HVA system, HVA uh, your, uh, heating and, and system for the building. It'd be too difficult. So a, a new building going up will be very much in demand. And I think you'll start to see a uh, differential pricing uh, for uh, new office buildings versus old office buildings. And exactly. uh, I think everybody going forward will be building, whether it's an apartment building or an office building, they'll be building it with a great deal of uh, uh, attention being paid to the health and wellness of that particular building. And it also goes to plumbing and water supply and, and uh, filtration systems used there. It's a, it's a different world today with more consciousness being placed. Right. Um, have, how, how, how are you seeing the capital, are the capital markets retracting during this time? Or are you seeing lenders um, sort of taking, looking at those type of features if they're, if they're making loans or are there more requirements or different requirements? from lenders so, to- uh, So I'll, I'll tell you, there's a positive and a negative, okay? There is so much money out there looking for loans to give loans. I, I've, I've never really seen it like that. It's completely different than 2009. In 2009, yeah. there was a liquidity issue, okay? Um, it, it was very, very different. Today, uh, there's a ton of money out there looking for deals. The problem is, is that that money is only going to the pedigree borrowers. Uh, people who've been established because there's too many jockeys out there that are unproven and many that of which failed in the past. So what's happening is, is that uh, for those who are of the pedigree borrowers, those who borrowed billions and billions of dollars in the past 30 years and have repaid every single dime of it on time, you know what, <laughs> there, there, there is no limit of capital. Um, so I think that that's very positive. I think it also opens up the market for new people coming into the industry because I, I think that uh, have yet to establish themselves if they can put together a deck that is representative of what they're trying to do, that explains what they're trying to do. You know what, they're gonna be very successful and, uh, and they'll get the capital. The thing is, is that they need to show um, a compelling case of why that particular real estate development makes sense today. And if they can do that, they can get the capital. There's plenty of MES funds out there uh, and so on and so forth. The problem is, and you know, we do some lending as well. The problem is most of the stuff that you see is ridiculously silly, ridiculously silly. So you, you have to be able to dream, but not make dreams your master. You have to deal with reality of where the market is today. And in many conditions, the market is different. Now, a lot of people say, you know what, uh, we're building out in the suburbs and everybody wants to be out in the suburbs, okay? And urbanism is dead, okay? But you know what? They're wrong. Urbanism is not dead. Urbanism is coming back. And you know what? It, the, the young people want to be next to their cultural centers of excellence. They want to be next to, um, you know, like in Dade County in Miami, okay? Everybody wants to be in that Edgewater, Brickell area. If you go down to Brickell, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is booming. And right. you know what, we're, what, uh, what these guys built in uh, um, uh, World Center is incredible. What will happen in World Center in years to come? I am telling you right now is an opportunity uh, because land is cheap there, opportunity is cheap there, and World Center will be another brickle. 
and and only oh. even better only even better because it's easier accessible it's accessible to miami beach it's right in the center of everything and there's where you really have your cultural museums i mean could you imagine living with the frost museum of science living with the pam uh for for art and and living with the art center and the cultural centers it's just it's just an incredible experience to live in an urban community and part of that is if you can live in Miami Beach or in the islands surrounding Miami Beach and be so close to these cultural communities, I mean, you're getting the best of all worlds. So I think we're gonna see change. I think that uh, the future is bright. Um, I think we have to speed along the vaccine as quickly as humanly possible. Yeah, you know, I, I feel the same way. And I, I hear people, even in New York City, you know, you talk about Manhattan and people are running to Miami and they're running away. and People are thinking that's the end of the end of New York. I mean, I, I don't I don't see that. I think that I agree with you. People do want to be in the cultural center, but we also see hedge funds and businesses from New York moving to South Florida. Do you think that trend will continue, or you know, <laughs> Manhattan's Manhattan and it's always going to be Manhattan? Uh, you know what what's going to happen? So I, I'll tell you what I see is that, uh, and and again, I, I my business is not in South Florida, although I do have a lot of business in South Florida, but in scope wise, it's national and international. And uh, we look all over the world. And, uh, but my heart and soul is really in South Florida. Um, I love the cruise line industry. And uh, there's no question that the, that Dade County and the Port of Miami is the world capital of the cruise line industry. Um, and uh, it all centers around that. So I, I would say to you that um, uh, South Florida uh, is the recipient of benefit from the Northeast, okay? Every time uh, Mayor de Blasio does something else that's silly, and believe me, I've never seen so much silliness in my life. It, we, Florida, Florida, South Florida is the recipient of so much of it. Now, a lot of it goes to Jacksonville and a lot of it goes to Orlando and a lot of it goes to Tampa, but we're the recipient of much of it, okay? Whether it's Palm Beach, Broward or, or Dade County. So uh, I think what's happening in New York, New York is never gonna go away. It's still is a city of immigrants. It's a city where people feel warm about and loving about, uh, and they can survive de Blasio. They survived Dinkins before, okay? They can survive de Blasio. De Blasio will be gone. The question is who takes over de Blasio and what happens to New York? You know, Crescent Heights' uh, major expanse throughout the United States came about because we were first in in Manhattan. And uh, we were also first out. We followed a first in, first out policy. Maybe we shouldn't have been out so fast, but you know what? Uh, we sold uh, uh, a great deal of real estate two years ago in Manhattan, and thank God we did. And uh, I can tell you, we're, we're, every building we sold, we're offered back today for more than $100 million less than what we sold it for, okay? More, each one. So I, I'm thank God we got out of there early. So what I think is that South Florida needs to start thinking about how to take on this opportunity because it is huge, okay? The wealthy, intelligent people from New York, and it's not only New York, it's Massachusetts, it's Connecticut, it's New Jersey. This wealthy upper end, the ones that have the PhDs, the doctorates and everything else, they're all looking to get out of these high tax states. It's unconscionable what's happening and they're coming to Florida. Now, my hope and prayer is that they come to Florida because we can certainly use them. We can widen our economic base. Uh, we need office use. I mean, Miami Beach is just pure hospitality. And you know what? Hospitality is in a problematic stage. They need to widen their base. They need this, uh, these great uh, funds and fund managers to come there. Uh, we, we, we are selling every magnificent home we have. They're being sold at, at the highest price ever. We need, yeah. we need this to continue. In order for it to continue, we need good governance, which means that we need new office space. And that would widen our economic base to have, uh, we won't only rely on the hospitality world because the hospitality world is gonna take time to come back, although it will come back. And uh, so I think we're the recipient of this uh, huge, huge influx. Now, the only thing I ask them to do, I, and I welcome them with open arms, is to not bring their uh, political views of taxation to Florida. Florida's, Florida's survival is the fact that we are a tax-free state and Absolutely. we're a beautiful Absolutely. state. So that's the only thing I would ask them not to do. Absolutely. I think everyone would agree with you there. I, I will also tell you one other thing is that Dade County, as it relates to the hospitality world, cannot come back until the cruise world comes back. 
And, and it's it's a really a pretty logical reason. And that is, is that if you take all your convention centers from Dade County, you add them together and you multiply it by five, they don't create the rooms demand that the cruise line does, okay? Right. The cruise lines, uh, basically 30% of everybody who goes on a cruise will stay either before or after 1.75 days. That's right. the statistics. And when you add up those statistics, that rooms demand is what feeds the hospitality industry in Dade County. So we need the cruise line industry to come back. Uh, I think they're working very aggressively to do it. They have some incredible leadership there. Uh, we have Frank Del Rio and uh, uh, Richard Fain and, and, um, uh, and a whole team of leadership with Carnival and uh, um, you know what uh, Teddy's son has done is fantastic. So I, I think that, um, that they will be back cruising um, next year, the beginning of the year. And I think that that's very exciting for us in South Florida. Yeah, that'd be great. You know, I want to, I don't want to switch over just real quick. You know, I, many of us have read about you recently forming a SPAC. And, you know, that's something that I, I find very fascinating. I know a little bit about it, but can you sort of give us a sort of a level 101 level sort of understanding of what a SPAC is and how that plays into today's market and why that would be a direction uh, to take? So uh, for sure, and, and thank you. Uh, it's actually a great question. Um, so let me tell you, uh, you know, in times of trouble, it's not only the development community that has to step up to the plate. It's really the government that has to step up to the plate. And part of stepping up to the plate is coming up with incentive programs and ways, and I'm gonna to get to the SPAC in a minute, and co coming up with ways to recreate the development community to start construction, spending money, creating jobs and building buildings, okay? And that's extremely important. And, and so the ways that they can do it is the creation of community reinvestment acts, uh, bond financing, uh, uh, all, all these types of things and streamlining processes. The government, is, you know, especially when it comes to construction in South Florida with the South Florida Building Code is overwhelming, overwhelming. But they're not the only state, okay? Dade, uh, California is overwhelming. They're, they're, New York is impossible. So there are, there are states, uh, although I wanna correct one thing about New York, New York is self-certified. So there, you know, New York is easy to build something in New York, but you know what, they're crazy when it comes to other issues. But in, in, uh, in Miami, in South Florida, it's extremely difficult, okay? They micromanage the development community to an extent that it is literally absurd. And, and when you talk to some of the politicians, they say, well, we can't trust the building community, okay? Well, if there's no trust, there's nothing. So you have, uh, every municipality has, has to go to Durham, why, why do we have to go to Durham? What other county in the state of Florida has a Durham? What other county has that? I mean, it's a little bit ridiculous um, that we have to go to Durham and, and have all of this stuff. Florida needs to streamline processes and government needs to get out of the way. One of those um, cities that's taken a leadership role is really the city of Miami. And that's surprising because everybody complains about Miami. But, you know, they, they, they created a downtown plan, a Miami plan, Miami 21 plan, and they created all these incentives. And, uh, and now they are streamlining the process that you're getting your plans back in 30 days. So even the worst department can sometimes become the best department. So, you know, so what I'm saying is that it's in times like this, you have to look at economic advantage. You have to look at communities that streamline their processes. We're a growing community and you can develop there. Now, as it relates to a SPAC, you know, SPACs have been around a long time and uh, everybody's talking SPAC, SPAC, SPAC. But what, it, what really is a SPAC? A SPAC is the creation of a public entity that's really a shell or a shelf company. Um, but it also gives you a time frame to find a target. And now is actually a, a great time for a SPAC because there are many problem children out there because of COVID not because they don't have the right management team, not because they don't have the right business plan. They have all of those things, but they have been drastically affected by COVID. That is one opportunity that a SPAC can help. Why? Because a SPAC raises cash and that cash goes to the combined unit. And, um, and you can even have a pipe and it can grow and so on and so forth. So do I think it's a huge opportunity to be part of a SPAC? It's a huge opportunity. It's almost like uh, being a child in a candy store and having 
hundreds of millions of dollars to buy whatever candy you want. Just pluck your candies right off the shelf. <laughs> you can pick whatever candies you want right, right off. So now we know Russell's in the candy store and he's plucking away. There we go. <laughs> yeah, you know, but along the same token is that you have to be disciplined. You have to be appropriate. You have sure. to, and you have to be willing to be in the public markets. It's not so easy to be in the public markets because everything about you and your personality and who you are and who your family is, is public. And there's nothing you're going to do. You'd be, you'd be surprised at some of the uh, public uh, releases that you have to file. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's funny in a way. And it's, uh, but, but I think if you can do that, if you can do that and you're willing to do that, um, then it's a unique opportunity because the, you know, what makes America strong? I mean, yeah, as you can say, it's a lot of things make America strong, but it's because of our people. Our people are intuitive, they're smart. Um, and uh, it's really what makes Israel great as well. I mean, Israel, when you look at it, I mean, uh, it's, it's a huge opportunity. I mean, um, you know, uh, Intel bought uh, Mobileye and brought it to America, you know? But yeah. all of that technology came from Israel. And uh, I can tell you from personally, from our SPAC, we have, um, we have developed since closing, and you know we've only closed our SPAC just recently. Um, and, I, and I can give you a little history on SPACs. I mean, uh, there are many SPACs that file, but very few actually ever fund and close. Oh, really? That's what people really don't I realize, know. okay? There are very few. Um, in fact, I think this year, there's only the 42 that, that funded and closed, like we're one of 42. So it's not really such a, uh, I can tell you 160 or 170 filed and are online, but for whatever reason, they've not been able to close or raise the money. Okay. And it's probably because of the jockey again, the jockey doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the success. And, and, um, and to some reason, you know, when, when you have a, a, a chairman or a CEO of a, of a new SPAC, and that gentleman has, has uh, sold billions of dollars with the real estate, uh, is the chairman of a Fortune uh, 500 company that's already on the New York Stock Exchange, and so on and so forth, it's, it's somewhat easier for that to raise the money. Um, and uh, and uh, so I think that that's part of why we were successful. Um, I can tell you, of the, since closing, which was three weeks ago, we have actually 80 targets, which is wow. incredible, 80 targets. And I'm really proud of one thing that uh, I think is really something to be proud of, is that 40 of those targets are in Israel, Israel wow. companies, is, and a lot of them are Israel technology. Fantastic. That's, that's terrific. And, you know, congratulations on that. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm following it. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Me too. Me right. too. As yeah. soon as you know, let me know. <laughs> you know, one of the, another aspect. You know, we're talking. You know, it's a good segue into Israel. One of the things that JNF does is JNF funds, um, you know, historical sites. So they're very involved with historical preservation in Israel, historical buildings. And I know those buildings are a lot older and more okay. historic than what we have here in Miami Beach and in the United States. But we all know that you've been involved with uh, the theater, historical theater and you know historical properties or you know important properties and you develop important properties of significance. Is there a, a tie-in or any thoughts when, when you see these older historical buildings and how they're preserved and how you're taking something that was a historically preserved building on Miami Beach and you take the care to preserve it. I mean, do you have, is there an emotional attachment to that or is it just another property? How, how do you treat a historic, historical property when you're dealing with it? You know, that's, that's really a great question because uh, uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm a big thinker issues guy. So for me, number one on, on my list is Israel. I love Israel and, uh, and I vote politically for Israel and I think for Israel. Um, as you know, my parents are buried in Israel. They loved Israel, um, but we're also a Miami Beach family. So, you know, the heritage that Miami Beach, the treasures that we have at Art Deco are really quite incredible, but so are they in Tel Aviv and so are they in Jerusalem. It's an architectural style of distinction and beauty that's uncomparable to anywhere in the world. And um, so they're, they're really gifts to us that we have to honor for generations after us, okay? So I feel really strongly about that. Unfortunately, again, it comes to politics and stupidity. 
So, um, you know, in, in Miami Beach, we, we try to very hard to protect our, our uh, Art Deco stock of properties, but we, we don't take into consideration nature nature, rising sea levels, things of that nature, uh, replacement of structural steel and flooring to safeguard these treasures, okay? Because we have a fanaticism from some individuals that comes with a lack of knowledge. You can have fanaticism, but you can't have a fanaticism without lack, with a lack of knowledge. Buildings need to be renovated. They need to be repaired. They need to be given new life. That doesn't mean you change the basic substance of the building or the style of the building, okay? But there are buildings that are going to collapse that are that, that are not salvageable that need to be replaced. That doesn't mean that they need to be replaced with the exact size and features of the historical building, but they need to be replaced that is respectful to the historical buildings around them. And as nature goes, you know, when you're an island that's one mile wide, seven miles long, you better open yourself up. and. You can include all of Dade County in that because guess what? We're really like an island. We are. We are. Um, uh, we have the Everglades on one side, and we have the intercoastal on the other side, and the ocean on the other side. We are very similar to an island. And I got to tell you, I'm really proud of Miami today. If you look at our skyline, if you look at our cultural centers of excellence, we are only a hundred year old city. You go to Manhattan; they have three hundred plus years. They have a building what they have there. Okay. We have done very well in the hundred years that we've had. And let me tell you, I am glad that I'm in South Florida. And I and I can hardly wait to see what our skyline will look like in five years from now, 10 years from now, and 20 years from now. Very exciting. And I think that uh, as it relates to our Art Deco treasures, we will save them one way or the other, even against the silliness of, uh, 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 of some individuals who, without knowledge, without experience, uh, think that uh, that they can force uh, things to be saved beyond what they can actually be saved. That's great, and you know the passion. The passion comes out every time you talk about your love for Miami and Miami Beach, and you know I know that you also have that love for Israel and JNF. Is you know they they fund those projects to bring tourism, to create jobs, and to turn them into museums. So you know that work is very uh, it's very important. I really enjoyed this. I mean, for me, it's an honor to be sitting here with you. I have so much respect for you and what you've done and all the support you give to Israel, to the community, and just, you know, I know of your generosity throughout. So I want to thank you for, for sharing this time with us. I think everyone tremendously benefited and um, it, it's really a pre pleasure. Thank you so much. Th thank you so much, Mitchell. I look forward to speaking again soon. Some of the questions they have here, they were asking, what adjustments has your company made to your portfolio due to the pandemic? And what opportunities are you looking at going forward? Good, good, great question. Uh, I can tell you that uh, without a doubt, there are some cities that are doing better and some states that are doing better than other locations. So uh, obviously South Florida is the recipient of uh, a great influx of the Northeastern uh, individuals. We have a, um, great state with a great governor and a great community leadership. Um, so, uh, you know, there is no housing stock, real quality housing stock to speak of. Uh, today, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times posted that our housing uh, pricing is up 25%. It's unprecedented in the history. So I, I think that, uh, you know, we're looking at South Florida uh, seriously, again, for major developments and major projects. We are building a NEMA project at 2900 Biscayne Boulevard. So we're excited about that. And I think that uh, change will continue. Um, and we'll see where it goes uh, in the months and years to come. In, in your new project, so the one that you just mentioned, are you incorporating any changes to the, or to the amenities? You mentioned in the, in the interview about maybe like um, touchless entry or air filtration. Is that being incorporated in now or are we now comfortable with the vaccine and where things no, no, are? I don't think anybody's completely comfortable with the vaccine. This really taught us many lessons. Um, and as I said earlier is, uh, look, we developed uh, a list of uh, 80 protocols for the cruise line industry, for cruise ships. And those same protocols are being instituted in new buildings being built today. So it's really about the health and wellness of the buildings that you build. And I can tell you 
um, it gives you an advantage to be a new build today over what was created over the last 30 years. A simple example of that would be office buildings. The fenestration on office buildings today is without the ability to open and close for fresh air. And one of the key protocols to fight any virus is fresh air. And uh, so we, we are building uh, some office space, uh, not a lot, but 150,000 square feet. It will meet every single protocol developed for the cruise line industry, every single protocol. So it'll be the safest and uh, healthiest building for offices uh, ever built in Dade County. So it's more than just air filtration. It also has to do with water, water quality. It has to do with fresh air and all of these abilities. That, that's, I mean, that's really tremendous that you can do that and really incorporate it and keep it cost effective, I'm assuming as well. Um, it, you know, also we talked about when we taped this, the, the rise of New Yorkers and Northeasterners coming to Miami. I think, I think that since we've spoken, that has multiplied, you know, tremendously and what's going on. All right, so now I'll ask you again, what impact do you think that will bring to Miami? One of the questions was asking about our poor transportation or school systems. How is that going to impact Miami and what we're seeing here? I think it actually helps Miami. Uh, you know, we, we've had a good public school system here. It's run by an incredible superintendent. Um, but I think that it also opens up the door for more private schools and, uh, and more financial help for those private schools. And uh, so I think that that's very exciting, uh, um, you know, what it does for us there. I also think that it, <clears throat> it brings a lot of employees because a lot of not just the owners of these companies are moving here, but they're moving their companies here. And for Miami Beach, that's really a blessing because um, Miami Beach's entire business community has been the hospitality world. We need to come up because the hospitality world was really destroyed with COVID. Miami Beach needs to come up with alternative sources of revenue. And that could be uh, a great office market where financial institutions, hedge funds, things like that could move their headquarters to Miami Beach. Our problem is that we don't have quality office space on Miami Beach. And um, we need that desperately. And unfortunately, we have some, uh, you know, uh, silly people, some people who are, you know, um, who fight everything, every change. Um, Miami Beach has a limited space. It's one mile wide by seven miles long. Uh, you add in all of Miami and uh, it's not much bigger, but we do need to, for quality office space, we need to provide 12 to 14 foot ceilings. We need to provide floor plates that are 12,000 to 20,000 square feet. There are a lot of things that we can do to attract these people. Um, and uh, it's not just Miami Beach, but Miami as well. We have to build quality office space and we also have to be able to uh, have them meet all of the protocols as a result of this terrible COVID virus. You know, one of, one of the questions that came in, it also relates to something that we had talked about was the tax structure in Florida. And you just brought it up and you basically said that, you know, look, Miami Beach and other municipalities are having some difficulty with municipal revenue. Uh, generating revenue. Do we think or do we see a tax change in Florida on the horizon or are we going to continue to be the low low tax corporate state and sort of make up for it in our property taxes and other other revenue generators? Two, two things uh, in response to that. Number one is that any change in the statewide tax uh, basis that we have would be ridiculous because that is what has given us such an incredible edge and such an incredible strength. Uh, as it relates to property taxes, you know, a case in point for the city of Miami Beach is an interesting one. City of Miami Beach is, uh, is the recipient of this huge increase in private home valuations. So uh, will that save them from the huge decrease in the valuation of the commercial properties? I think they may weigh each other out. They may weigh each other out, but I will tell you, it was so ridiculously outweighed previously where the commercial properties on Miami Beach were supplying 75% of the total cost of administration. And the homeowners were getting the deal of a lifetime only supporting it to the tune of 24 or 25%. You know, that will change because the new valuations of houses have gone up so excessively in the last year, it, um, it's going to change that disproportionate amount. 
And, and I think just we're supposed to go out to the breakout room, but I just want to ask you real quick on the cruise industry. You know, we've seen we've seen the changes and you're talking about changes to the cruise industry. Are we going to see the cruise industry coming back just as vibrant as before? Or, you know, I'd like to think so. And are there changes? Are we going to see changes on our next cruise? Are there still going to be the open buffet? Or, you know, what can you tell us what's happening when we go on our next cruise, Russell? Okay, so first of all, let me say I'm very fortunate because uh, my involvement is with NCL, which really has the newest ships uh, at sea. So we were very, you know, not easy, but I would say it was easier for us to bring all of our ships into compliance with the new COVID protocols and, to, and so on. We never had a lot of smorgasbords on any of our ships. It was not one of our things. And um, so I think, yes, you, those uh, cruise lines and those ships that do have them, you're going to see major change. Um, and uh, that major change will be complete uh, shielding of the food product with no one being able to take their own plate. It'll be somebody behind the counter taking their plate and, and putting on their plate whatever they would select. So I think those types of changes you will find. I think initially the ships will not be full. They'll be, um, they'll be at probably sailing at 80%, not because their demand is not there. The demand is there, right. uh, but primarily because uh, we would like to follow some safety protocols to ensure that if there is any issue, we have plenty of flexibility and plenty of uh, rooms um, for somebody who, who uh, could uh, be isolated, can be isolated. Um, I think the cruise world starts up with a vengeance. People wanna go on cruising. Uh, we are more booked for next year than we've ever been booked this far in advance. And I'm really proud of that. That's, that's tremendous. And you know, look, as long as no one's counting how many plates of food I'm you taking- You can't from hear, the right? Line. So, <laughs> so um, thank you again, Russell. Again, it's always a pleasure to be with you. We're going to have the breakout room, but before we go, Adam has a few more words to, to share with us. And again, Russell, thank you so much. Um, I, I personally love hearing you talk whenever you say anything. And to me, it's like uh, gospel. So, thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Let me unmute myself. Can everybody hear me? Um, yeah. Russell, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was um, amazing and uh, greatly appreciate your time. Avnet, same thing. And thank you for everybody who participated in today's call. Um, in a moment, we're going to do a breakout room where we can chat with Russell more and hear more of his insights about uh, just everything. And uh, I really I, I appreciate hearing from somebody with so much depth of knowledge from a Miami-based perspective, being a local down here and also what he knows in government and business. And uh, happy to hear that the cruise industry is uh, trending where it is. I'm looking forward to my next cruise. Um, for those of us on the call, we hope that you decide to join our real estate network and be part of our JNF family. Uh, we're raising a billion dollars to invest in the land of Israel and its people and join us in our march on this 120 year legacy to build the nation. Again, membership comes with a minimum of $1,800 that can be paid monthly. Gift is tax deductible and includes sponsorship for the future. Uh, nationally advertised real estate program with 60,000 people to reach um, during our email addresses. And you'll also receive access to that nationwide directory that I mentioned. Um, you can make your gift today if you'd like by clicking in the chat, which will allow you to make your donation online. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for our next program, which is gonna be March 11th at eight o'clock. This will be interactive. We're gonna do virtual poker. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to beating everybody on that. So bring it on. And again, thank you for your support, your passion, and uh, your partnership with us investing in the land of Israel and for generations to come. I'm Israel Chai, and let's chat. Thanks, everybody.